think you'll hear me anyway, but uh, <laughs> good morning, everyone. Um, Selamat pagi. Um, warm welcome to UNU IIGH. Um, I think I see a few familiar faces, which is a, a good sign. It means that our seminars are interesting and useful, or you like our lunch. Hopefully, <laughs> it's a bit of both. <laughs> Um, for those of you who have not been um, to UNU and IGH, an extra warm welcome. I hope you will come back. Um, I want to say a few words about who we are, and then also a few words about the Gender and Health Seminar Series, which this is a part of. Um, and then I will introduce our um, amazing speaker here today. We're very for fortunate to have her here. Um, so I also wanted to first kick off with introducing the team. Um, we realized we haven't been very good at doing that. And, there are a couple of us in the room, so we'll just say who we are, so you know um, who we are, and you can reach out to us as well later during the lunch. So my name is uh, Dr. Michelle Remet. I'm, um, I lead the research pillar here at uh, UNUIHH. We have our director here, um, Professor Pascal Alente, um, and we have, well, actually, should I let people introduce themselves? Do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> And Sue? And, 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 and I'm a programs intern. I am Nadia, the programs officer. Thank you. So that's us. I think a few of us might still be streaming in. Um, and yes, so just to tell you a bit more about us. So the United Nations University is actually a, a think tank for the UN system, meant to be a bridge between the academic community and the UN um, agencies, programs, and member states. Um, so IIGH in particular, so the Institute, International Institute for Global Health, is one of 14 institutes that comprise the United Nations University. Um, and we're spread in 12 countries around the world. We are very grateful to be hosted here by the Malaysian government. Um, and our, our focus, or our mandate, is to build knowledge and capacity for decision making um, by UN agencies and member states to advance evidence-based policy on key issues related to development and global health. So one of our strategic priorities is to produce policy relevant analysis to decrease uh, gender disparities in health. And that's, that's where this gender and health seminar series falls. Um, we think this is particularly important because um, we know that gender equality and women's empowerment are, are inextricably linked to health. Um, and we, so we cannot address one without addressing the other. But we also need much more solid evidence to demonstrate what can we do about those disparities? How can we reduce them? How can we address them? What is effective? So that we can then inform policy and programs um, and to be more effective, um, to reach both gender equality outcomes and health outcomes. At the moment, um, this is one of our focuses of our work, but we don't only generate policy relevant analysis. We have two other streams of work or pillars of work here. So one of them is to translate evidence to policy, and we do that by convening policy dialogues, um, seminars, bringing together experts from academia, civil society, governments, to uh, generate recommendations on key public health and global health issues and to disseminate these recommendations for action. So a bit more about the Gender and Health series. Um, this is, so this series, this seminar today is one of our some, uh, Gender and Health seminar series, um, which we're roughly doing on a quarterly basis. This one is a bit more, at the moment we've been a bit more frequent with them. Um, the aim is really to provide a, an engagement platform to stimulate discussion and conversation on how we can remove gender-related barriers uh, that impede people's access to health services and their realization of their, their right to health and to well-being. So today is our first Gender and Health series with a focus um, on Malaysia and evidence from Malaysia. So I'm very excited because it provides us really with a uni unique opportunity to unpack the intersection between gender and health in the Malaysian context. And we very much look forward to all your inputs and, and um, your experiences and expertise in this area as well as part of the discussion. I would like to also flag one thing. I don't know if people know the IHH, we have an internship program. Um, so we offer internships to graduate level students or young professionals with a keen interest to gain more experience in global health. Um, our colleague who leads on that is not here today, but if you have any questions on that, Nadia, you can reach out to Nadia or to possibly Eichling or any, of us, any one of us really, and we're happy to provide more information. Um, so that's, that's the, the quick introduction about us and, and who we are. Um, 
Uh, there's also a few housekeeping issues. Um, so the location of the washrooms are just on, the, you exit in this door on the left side and on the right side. Um, we would like to encourage you to please silence your mobile phones. Um, and also, if you want to communicate on social media, we have a couple of hashtags, which I realize we should have put up. Um, but I'll give you one, because I know we can't remember too many. Um, hashtag SDG5 for SDG3. Um, and don't forget to tag us, you and UIIG. Last point on consent, we are video, we are filming these sessions, so if you have um, any concerns or you feel uncomfortable, please reach out to any of us and we will you know, not include that in the version that we put online. Um, I don't think we have photos taken being taken today, right? Okay. All right, so now it's my um, honor to introduce our speaker, um, Professor Dr. Sharifa Ezad wan -Pute. She's a trained medical doctor with a master's in public health and a PhD in health economics from UNUIIGH. Um, Professor Sharifa is the current Deputy Dean uh, Relation and Wealth Creation at the Faculty of Medicine uh, at the UKM Medical Center. Her many previous roles include Head of ITCC UKM, Head of Hospital and Health Management Unit, and Consultant to the Prime Minister's Department on Prevalence of Autism Among Children in Malaysia. So a very warm welcome to you, and I'm very pleased to have a health department. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michelle, for the kind introduction. Uh, very good morning, and uh, yeah, it's here in June, and uh, thank you to Prof. Quality for providing the platform to present some of the, uh, I would say, concerns that we have for Malaysian women. Uh, in particular, some of the research that I'm going to dwell to is uh, on the B40 women. Um, thank you to my colleagues and friends who come to the to the seminar and um, I'm not going to take too long of your time. Uh, most of these issues has been uh, in the media platform for so many times and so many years that I think that uh, some of us have already digested and vomited this out <laughs> without any, uh, I would say, proper um, concrete evidence. We, we do have small research here and there. In fact, mine is also small in a way. Uh, but it's just that I think that the government's uh, stand on a woman's um, problems and issues and concerns and governance and law are not that strong. I'm not sure whether we, we don't have enough women participants in the ministries. We, we do, but then it's still mostly are, are still uh, managed by so-called the men and uh, in some areas that um, there are still issues, especially on rights, uh, marriage and things like that, that uh, we still see a lopsided uh, you know, view on, on certain things, which I think that uh, most of you or some of you may want to dwell into or do more research into that. We're not going to even touch on migrants and asylum seekers. And that's another whole Pandora box which uh, we can discuss at other platforms and so on. So mine is to be more on the woman in Malaysia. So of course, why women? Uh, we know the problems of women. We are the easier sex, you know, the weaker sex, and so on. Um, we, we know that. And uh, in, of course, in Malaysia, this is seen as uh, religious and cultural aspects as well and we know that women are involved with a lot of things including childbearing, taking care of the husband and household but also uh, dependency ratios eh, for, for, for elderly and so on eh, where women uh, takes a lot of, uh, of the of the, of the bar. and we know that with feminization of society most of us will actually live longer than our counterparts uh, your partner will die earlier you can remarry, most of us don't, but we live longer. So we are more prone for chronic diseases and we are more prone for depression, say loneliness and things like that. So these are some of the things. Eh? And why women have to be more positive? Because in the end, the childbearing, eh? the, the taking care of the society, basically the family members, and also the society, most will come to the shoulders of the woman, even though you're working, right? I mean, most of you will say, right, right. I mean, most of you are working, but you still have to take care, you know, some form of that. It doesn't have to be that you go back and cook, but it means that you're taking care of the food for the family and, and things like that. Especially if you have elderly parents or if you have disabled children, um, the burden will be more. Eh? So in a way, you are, or, or we are at more risk, right? So women have to be more positive. Eh? Uh, we have to be more healthy. We are prone to so many diseases. Eh? We are, we have thinner epitheliums. We have 
you know, so many other problems. We are supposed to have this IQ and things and, and, and some of the literature. Eh? So there's a lot of things that put us at risk. Eh? So if you look at the gender inequality and labor force uh, by, by sex as well, so we are at the, you know, visa, uh, even in Malaysia, and you can see that um, from the latest data from our department of statistics, it doesn't change so much. Just going to give you an overview. You, you, can you imagine that in the last National Health and Mobility Survey, the cost of death of all participants or all population in Malaysia are mostly related to cardiovascular diseases, but if you tailor that by gender, women die of infection. So then you think that why infection? Everybody is dying of road traffic accidents and non-communicable disease. But women's cause of death, one of them, or the highest of them, one of the two highest is actually pneumonia, which means infection. And then you start to think, why is this inequality? Because you don't die infection in the 2020s. This is nearly 2020 for Malaysia, okay? but you still die of infection. Community acquired this problem. <coughs> then you start to think, you know, what is the problem with excess that delays this woman from getting help? You know, so uh, that's one issue. Which I, the data is not here, but you can always search on it. So we we've heard about the SDGs and the MDGs. So we are supposed to improve maternal health and things like that, including women's health, and we are supposed to have universal access and things like that. So this has been quite slow to meet the target, including for Malaysia. And when women are more engaged, they are more healthy, we can see that the effects goes trickle down to the families, the community becomes better, they are better fed, they are better groomed, the income becomes better, higher, and savings and, and so on. So even in Malaysia, we can see this disparity, uh, even though it's not uh, probably um, exposed highly in the newspapers. Um, of course, there's issues in that, but uh, it's more hush hush, eh? so we don't actually uh, say this so much eh? in the newspapers and things like that. Eh? And um, so when we talk about the B40, what does that mean? So in Malaysia generally, they're divided into three tiers, so-called the T20, the M40, and the B below. The M is the middle and the T is the top. And so your highest income level of 20% of the whole distribution of income in Malaysia, of course this is controlled by certain corporates and certain peoples and individuals, so they are very rich. And of course, you have the middle income group and you have the lowest. Eh? So this level of how much you earn per month actually determine where are you now, right? So the B40s, so-called the B40s, eh, previously it was like 3,800, eh? um, let's say just rough, a ballpark figure would be like 4,000. You earn less than that, you're considered a B40 family. Right now, it has uh, it, it goes by your by year. Eh? So now the level has become a bit higher, right? So the B40 goes from extreme of zero to like four thousand, right? If you want to use the latest statistic, it would be like four thousand plus, eh? nearly five thousand. But there's a whole range of tiers as well. From the B40, you have the B10, B15, B20, and things like that. Eh? So actually, by right, for, for my personal opinion, and I think a few others, it should be tailored. How the government tackles B40 should be tailored by each tier. I have a friend that mentioned that IGN, our uh, institute Jantung Negara, our heart institute, they have a co-payment, you know that? So there's a co-payment for service as well, for heart problems, even among the B40. So it's like everybody that goes for treatment, so you need to pay some sort of co-payment for, for the treatment. It's not that high, right? Yeah, we know that. It's not that high because these are the, for all, this is the B40 group. But then if you put it, lump sum for the whole B40, then you start to think, is this equal or not? Because you have the whole range of zero to 4,000 or 4,500. Eh? So, but for me personally, it should be tailored by tiers. Eh? So not everybody can afford to pay even the co-payment. Eh? So in a way, it can be a deterrent. Eh? There's no specific research to say this can be a deterrent. Whether this is a moral hazard to the behavior of the consumers, there's no study yet. But you know, these are things that, as, as people who are involved, us healthcare providers, we should be concerned, right? Because they may be exposed to catastrophic health expenditures, right? Shock, health shock, and they might actually forego the treatment. So we don't know that. We don't know actually how many should have gone the denominator, and how many should have actually who have actually seek healthcare. We don't know. Eh? We don't know. So so there's still issues eh, in the background, right? So so there's a lot of things. Eh? Uh, the B40 group becomes the main focus for areas. Eh? Uh, this was during the previous government, headed by Najib, and now again, I think with the new government, uh, 
we see it less now because there's so many issues on politics which has clouded the, the issues of the community. Eh? But um, this remains a, a big issue as well. Of course, this is by, by ethnic, we know that this is a problem mainly by the Malays, right? And uh, followed by Indians and Chinese as well. They're not so big, eh? but mostly by the Malays. Eh? So you have about 4,000 population who are in this B40 group. Some of them have actually put up inside the ikase or it's like inventory of, of, of people you know below uh, this income level. So you have to register, there's some proof that you have to master up and things like that. Right? So the target was at that point in time to double the income and the median income for the population by next year. They increase, uh, they should do an evaluation whether they have actually doubled that. There's so many actually help by the government. You know? Help means there's a lot of like funding for small businesses, SMEs and things like that. But we are not sure whether that has actually translated into better... The policies is there, but that has translated into better people accessing the help and actually become you know, entrepreneurs or have removed themselves from the B40 to the M40 group. We don't know. There's, I, I, don't see, I don't see the report. There might be some you know, reports here and there, but it's very hush-hush again because I think it was not so effective. There's a lot of decages. Eh? We know that there's a lot of decages. So I don't think the government is able to prove saying that with all the funding that they have actually poured out to the community in trying to improve the health and also income, whether there was any effective now. I'm sure there was some effective, but how much, you know, how many percent actually has has uh, successfully migrated from B40 to M40. Eh? And I'm not being biased. Eh? I'm not being biased. I, I'm trying to be neutral and you know tackle the problems. Eh? Of course, we are in health, so most of our area will be on health. But we know there are certain um, people in the economic area, the Faculty of Economics, you know, uh, Department, the Ministry of Finance, and things like that, who are looking into this, and we hope that they are going to uh, relate to the problem and actually expose the results. Eh? To expose it <laughs> because it's so hush hush now. So one of the findings was that it's very true that I think this is worldwide, you know, female-headed household, they would be more exposed, more at risk of shock, uh, CHE, catastrophic health expenditures as well, and income deprivation and of course risk of mental health issues if they are alone. Yeah? These are some of the findings. Yeah? Now this might not be similar to all countries. We know that other countries would have different um, absorbers or how they tackle health issues, yeah? but we are talking in general for certain Middle income and, of course, low income countries are even worse uh, on, on these matters. Right? So, um, we know that um, a lot of the lower income group would actually access free so called subsidized healthcare uh, in general, right? But, uh, but we know now the access to healthcare in Malaysia, in Malaysia is basically it's a universal coverage. I mean, we're talking about the public sector, of course. Of course, in the private, you still have to pay fee for service and out of pocket payment. But uh, we still see a majority of the prevalence of people who have disease. Example, cancer. We talk about okay, like example, eh, breast cancer. Very, very something which is I like to talk about cancers because uh, my, my my PhD was on cancers as well. We see that a lot of women uh, they come for they don't come for screening early. If they come, they are already at the like two stage two B and above, like stage three cancers, breast. You already have the lump, you know, uh, metastasis somewhere else. So what is the problem? You have universal coverage and the National Health Mobility Service that every three kilometers to five kilometers, you have a healthcare. Either it's like a, a big clinic or a small clinic, but there's going to be someone tackling these healthcare issues. Yeah? So why are people not coming in? They don't have to pay. It's free. You have universal health coverage. Yeah? So now we see that the trend in the insurance as well, that they are even providing so-called transportation costs. Right? In Thailand, you go for pet screen, you get money. So that's one, that's one of the reasons that people actually you know, go for screening. In Malaysia, you come, you, you get some cursing from the, the nurse at the counter and things like that. Uh, Why so late? I mean, that's the, because the burden is so high. You know, people get easily agitated and then you know, take it up on the next patient. So, and you see this, the trend in even in mental health issues as well. Eh? We're talking in general, asylums, you know, once they don't have funding, the staff is going to go on rampage to the patients, you know, they're going to deprive them, they're going to do a lot of abuse to the patients, and you can see this. Eh? Of course, we don't abuse our patients, but the treatment that they get from the public and private is definitely a two-tier system, right? And we know this, eh? the government knows this as well. So in a way, we want to look at how, how is the quality of life of, of patients, of, of, of respondents, eh? our, our B40 women and so on. Um, 
Now, if you relate this with maternal health and also risk of childbirth, uh, perinatal, neonatal, and so on, um, most of this, you know this as well, it occurs in the low and middle income. Okay? And of course, uh, Malaysia is considered a middle income. And we are so-called in the upper middle income. I don't know, by the next two, three years, we might go to middle, middle income. Back, eh? We don't know. And the main cause include a lot of things, eh? infectious, non-infectious, excess, uh, and which can be confounded by a lot of covariates, including income and education. Eh? I think all of these are common knowledge. For Malaysia, the trend has been like so far plateaued. And um, we start to wonder why is that so? Eh? We should have gone up. Eh? Maternal mortality has been quite static for the past few years. Eh? And of course, uh, this relates again to women. Eh? This is one of the reasons that I'm talking about this. Alright, so this is what I mentioned just now. Eh? The bottom 40th percentile income, household income group. This is so called what we call as the B40, right? And um, this level, which is the B40, right? This group. And you can see the trend is, is like improving. You can see that the income is so-called increasing. But you can imagine the household uh, cost now is not the same as previous 10 years ago. With all the inflation eh, and things like that. Eh. Previously, like you have two ringgits, you can buy a good nasi lemak, a big fan. And now you like, like you know, to ringgit, well, you can still buy a nasi lemak. It's very scanty, no telur, no ikan bilis, no anchovy. It's like just the sambal and the ikan eh? and, and the nasi. Eh? Uh, so it's like that's the worst of to ringgit now. So the income of B40, eh, it has it has increased, eh? but it's not enough to actually meet the demand of our our household now. Eh? The cost. Eh? So this is again the definition. Eh? I'm not going to dwell into this. Um, and this relate with. Uh, another finding that we have, just going to touch a bit on that, is that how does the mothers actually fend the children? Or basically how you cook for your children, right? Once you're too busy because you have to go and meet your nasi lemak stall and kuih, or you go for swimming class, or you work sometimes, and what happens to the children? Uh, and I'm at risk as well because my children are forever without me. And most of the time, when I come back, usually I'm like, just like I'm just like oh, I just want to rest. Don't catch on me. And don't disturb me. I'm gonna turn into a she hulk Don't disturb me. You go and eat whatever you can from the from the kitchen. You cook. So in the end, you know. And this is more pertinent in the B40s because there's always they are always on the go. They have to work. And sometimes, most of the time, the husband and also wife work in the urban area. Rural, you might have the opposite where the men only work and the husband, the wife, sorry, the men work and the husband, uh, the wife may stay at home in rural area. But in the urban poor, urban B40s, most of the time the husband plus the wife also work. And this is what happened: you lock your child in the house because you don't want them to go out. They start to move out and they go up the railing. And this is one of the reason you see a lot of death and falls, right? Of course, this might be like one. One incident here, and then another six months, you get one incident there. But if you see the trend, nobody has done that. Then you should just see the trend of GIS and look at these cold and hot cases of B40. You can see that these are mostly concentrated among the the B40 urban areas. And again, it's very it's very sad. So, and this is definitely physical hazard because you basically die if you fall from your flat. But the nutrition as well, nutrition. And once they are they are not able to access good food high protein, uh, bodybuilding food, then they go into cheap food. Uh, bubble tea is expensive, eh? but then they make their own bubble tea. They have, they always have the stall at the bottom. Uh, no brand, no tea life, whatever, but they always have the bubble tea, which is relatively very sweet. You know, It's, it's satisfying to the children's taste, but then there's no nutrition. Eh? So poor nutrition is an issue. Eh? And uh, of course, the government is doing a lot of work, eh? entrepreneurship and things like that. This was the previous government. Now we have a lot of other things as well. But again, we're not so sure how, how effective is this. Eh? We should propose a study to see how effective is this, especially for the low-income women. Eh? Uh, for the whole generation, I mean, for the whole population men, we, we I'm not so worried. Of course, we I, I expect the same thing. But we are more, more worried about the women, eh? especially the women, eh? because they are more at risk. Eh? They start to ask favors. Once they ask favors from the top level, they go for sexual favors, you know, uh, and, and things like that. Of course, nobody talks about this, eh? but you know, that sexual favors does not mean that you have to sleep with him. Eh? It can be just a touch. It can be something, you know, a call, you know, things like that. Eh? Favors, eh? and sometimes this is not uh, something that you want to do, you know. But they have to do it for certain reasons, especially if they have children. 
and we have qualitative data to show that. We have qualitative uh, I'll show you the study after this. So studies of, of some of the literature, this is from literature. Eh? Um, it shows that you know uh, studies of low-income women have findings. Yes? Some, a lot of them are unsatisfied with the services, and very unsatisfied and unsatisfied, yeah? especially coming from the public health system. All right. So most of these are from the urban women. They are unsatisfied with a lot of healthcare as well. Well, this was a previous literature some time ago. And we know that the government have tried, the previous government has tried to put up a lot of clinics, eh? Clinic Satu Malaysia. Eh? Clinic Satu Malaysia, the one, uh, one uh, Clinic Satu Malaysia, one Malaysia clinic, eh? which is abundant. But they are unmanned by uh, doctors. They are just trained by paramedics and things like that. So you can understand that the level of drugs and also treatment that they receive from the clinics. Eh? Uh, personal uh, Personal opinion would be, um, example, that when we provide some screening and services in the northern state, uh, we will ask the community, uh, your BP is so high, your blood pressure, you know, we take the blood pressure of the patients and all. And we say that your BP is so high, have you not been following up, have you, are you not compliant to the medication? And then the poor old machi or the lady will say that, no, I went and see the clinic, Satu Malaysia, the MA, the medical assistant, the paramedics there. I have been so many times, but they just write, I saw the book, it's like 150 over 110 with no increment of medicine, it's just given like propanol law which is like very basic you know, and I was thinking like what is these people doing? Uh, of course there might be an isolated incident, it might be a road case, right? But if you see this for the whole country, looking at how prevalent NCD, I'm not surprised that this is something which is done very rampant especially if there's no monitoring, there's no audit by the top level people and things like that yeah? So by the amount of clinic, I'm not sure whether to say this is going to be more effective. But we now we know that clinics are Malaysia already bumpos already. Eh? So um, so this is the e status eh? uh, in 2013, some time ago, where they have about 500 uh, population and about about one fifth maybe um, one fourth eh? uh, actually move out supposedly move out of poverty and hopefully they don't return, eh? right? So this was some of the uh, health system ratios. Uh, you can see this is the number of practice to population and so on. Eh? So this is some of the problems, existing problems in the healthcare that is compounding the, the issues in, with B40 women access as well. Eh? And like I mentioned just now, the income findings, eh, you see a, a, a total different income by median and also mean wages by, by sex as well. Eh? So you have, um, have of course, a female actually earn uh, less than, than men. Eh? So there's always this gender gap eh, and the labor participation, right? So now, now I'm going to reiterate on some of the studies uh, that I have done, uh, of, to, of course, together with some friends. And I'm, I'm no champion. There's, there's nothing that I do it on my own. I, I'm sorry. There's a lot of studies, but we do it together as a team, eh, or I'm part of a team. Eh? So there's one study that we did together with UNICEF. Um, it was funded, funded, was funded by them. It was a, a very simple cross-sectional studies. Eh? Uh, it was uh, mainly by the surveys eh? and together with EPU, sorry, UNDP and of course uh, UKM and we look at adults uh, more than 18 years old. So the study actually covered both men and female, both uh, genders and they look at the quality of life and eh? uh, visual analog score and things like that. And they look at depression as well. So the number of uh, population that was uh, covered at one center, uh, one of the centers eh, in the central zone was about 340. Out of them, about 200 was female, right? And um, most of these are in the middle age, eh, and women was about, you know, uh, 61 percent. And uh, most of these are Malays. Eh? Of course, uh, you have a bit of Indian, para uh, the Bumi, Bumitra, eh? Sabah, Sarawak. A bit of Chinese, eh? but uh, most of them do not want to come forward. They don't want to be acknowledged as a as a B40 or recipient of the e as well. Most of them are married, eh? uh, secondary school, employed, and things like that. Of course, very low. Um, well, the income is quite low eh, per month, eh? less than one thousand. Majority of that. Some of have uh, earnings more than four thousand. Eh? So then we start thinking, okay, they are, they should not be coming, eh? or they have just reached the middle income, eh? so they are still in the group. Eh? And of course, uh, when we look at the screen for quality of life, eh, uh, a lot of them have a bit of uh, moderate to severe depression and anxiety, eh, anxiety depression. Eh. So uh, that's very scary. Eh. We hope that they don't actually go into severe depression. And uh, depression screening was about 
almost 40 percent uh, out of the whole group have some form of uh, positive pressure as well. Okay? So that means um, the group of people, these people are actually at risk of a lot of mental health issues. Right? This is why they smoke, then they start, they don't have money. And then they try to stop smoking by vaping, which does not actually end up with success. So then they spend money on tobacco, which is actually very expensive. Then they want to stop smoking, they go on vape, then they spend money on vape as well. So now they're dual users. So they're exposed to high nicotine as well. So um, when we look at gender and, and quality of life, eh, male, female and things like that, right? People who have the moderate and severe problems eh, were about 40% were females. Eh? Remember we talk about the gender, a lot of people have depression and by gender we see that these are mainly females. Right? And the males will have general health status uh, under moderate and severe quality of life. And um, males will also have high depression as well. And when they when we did a qualitative study, eh, they would say that you know they had they tried to borrow some money from the government, you know, but there's always a middleman. And this middleman would actually say you okay, you get like five thousand for a small burger stall and things like that. Then in the end, you know, the burger store will have like 1,000, the rest will go to the middleman and things like that. So there's a lot of stories like that. And it was put inside the report. It was delivered, and this was a few years back. The report was actually delivered to UNDP and EPU and things like that. And, but how, you know, how to tackle this problem by them, we are not sure. So these are things that, you know, uh, the government is trying to make right by providing a lot of services, but how effective are they, we're not sure. And uh, we see that a lot of these uh, females would have medical illness okay? because once they stay at home, they don't they eat a lot and uh, not nutritious food. I mean, eat a lot maybe you know uh, just carbohydrate and they don't exercise. Once if they work, then the children are also exposed because no one is cooking right for the children as well. Eh? So you can see that uh, thirty five percent of the females at that point in time have all these uh, chronic diseases compared with the uh, men, eh? and uh, that was significant. Eh? All right. Okay, and um, yeah, this is for the females. Eh? So, <coughs> among the women only, which is two hundred and ten, we know that a lot of them, when we look at the quality of life, eh, most of them will have some impairment if they also have concurrent medical illness. Eh? And we see this for the five domains. Eh? So you have, you can, we can read a lot, eh? and you can see that. But I, I'll just give you the gist of it: is that from the domains of the quality of life. Most that has low quality of life, they are associated with having a medical illness. That means if you are unhealthy, you have a chronic disease, basically your quality of life is going to be lower and this has been proven as well in Malaysian setting. Of course, you know this in overseas, eh? it is it's very pertinent. And uh, mostly these are women of older age. So because you are older, then you are not able to access healthcare. You, it's difficult for you to go down the, the, the stairs. Sometimes the leaf do not work, sometimes there's no leaf, there's, there's, sometimes there's no water, you have to bring up by a pail and things like that. So women of older age, higher parities, eh, uh, Malays, singles, they will have and also medical illness, they will have an uh, impact quality of life compared with the other population. Eh. So these, these risks are, are significant. Eh. Alright, so now we know that from that study, we know that a high percentage would have these chronic NCDs, yeah? asthma, hypertension, diabetes, with poor treatment. And we wonder why you are having poor treatment or poor compliance because you're on universal health coverage and you still access the one clinic, but you are not, you know, the, the, the treatment is always something like subpar, you know, substandard. So women experience poorer quality of life, especially if this is compounded by the medical illness. Okay. Another study, uh, this was another study that we did about Orang Asli. Eh? We provided again services to the Orang Asli. Orang Asli is the indigenous people of Malaysia. So they are supposed to be the original inhabitants of, of the country. Right? And most of this has dwindled from the cities. They would go into the rural area near the forest and things like that. Some of them do actually live in the urban, yes. Their trend of work and also trend of uh, nutrition has changed and they are eating like reservoirs so obesity is a problem but these are orang asli which is very off-road these are in the near Kelantan oh, Kelantan is one of the state which uh, the GDP for that country is one of the state is one of the lowest in Malaysia okay. so it's a very rural area this is where Siti Kasim always goes and promote on the issues of, of, of equality for orang asli remember that so it's part of the you know, uh, we did part of a study by a bigger group. Eh? It's a five hours off-road, eh? so we were like, um, we were like in the 
off-road vehicle and was, we were sleeping and the car would go like because it's, there's no road so it's like really it's really bouncy and things like that very scary and uh, it's about the denominator for the whole uh, village was about 600 plus uh, orang asli eh? and we just are able to screen about 100 eh? only 100 turn up eh? and most of them were were uh, males and quite young eh? about 20 years old and of course you have the female which is younger and we asked about you know because they are not able to speak our language eh? uh, i don't know whether they purposely don't, don't want to talk or they really don't know but when we ask most of them do not know eh? so we have to ask through an interpreter or someone that or most of the time it's just sign language eh? so when we ask whether you have like vomiting headache and things like that so we ask by symptoms eh? um we did not take any blood eh? so there was not nothing invasive was done eh? so we look, we look at the relationship between genders and presence of symptoms and things like that eh? it was not significant maybe because of the small sample size but from the hundred uh, patients uh, sorry from the 100 and from the woman that came there, from the woman is about 60, is it? 60%. Uh, a few of them actually suffer, majority suffer from anemia, small stature, a bit of URTI. Tinea was very rampant, so we know now there's a lot of tinea problems as well. And a few of them actually have goiter, and these were pregnant women. And you see the, the, the tummy when they are pregnant is so small, eh? so you can expect that the baby is going to be very small and things like that. Eh? And um, we look at symptoms and eh? we ask them about symptoms. Eh? So we know that um, the men actually have high BP, eh? uncontrolled BP. We're very, very surprised eh? because one, a lot of them come and they start smoking tobacco. But this is uh, not our our traditional tobacco. These are self-planted tobacco, tobacco uh, plants that they actually plant and use as, 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 as cigarettes. Eh? Of course, sometimes they buy, but because it's expensive, so they are not able to actually assess that. So they plant their own. <coughs> so most of them, the males would have high BP. We don't know <coughs> whether this is because of the tobacco or is this because of the food they eat in the plants. Because for them, tongkari is considered a herb and something which is good and healing. Yeah? Of course, the other other proportion of Malays would use tongkari for different things. But for them, it's a healing substance. So, so they use a lot of plants, eh, which, which we, we, we understand, <coughs> because they live in the forest. So are they exposed to certain plants that cause the BP to be high? We don't know. <coughs> so it's very interesting. So the problem is that, from, from what I see, is that there's a lot of areas that do a lot of studies on Ora Asli. But there should be a funding where they cover a whole bunch of areas so that you can have a, a good overview of what's the risk by different areas. <coughs> now, this, this, this few kampongs are deep in the rural jungle. There are different kampongs that live nearby a, a lake, Tasichini. I, I did not do the study there. But some of our colleagues that do the study th there, they are used to fishing. Right, because it's near a lake, so that's their main, uh, you know, how they seek food. But now the fish has depleted because of tourism, because of the climate change, whatever, and pollution. So that the, this lake is not as healthy as before. There's, there's less food, so they have gone into other means of, of food. Okay? So different orang asli or different Aborigines would have different exposures as well. Right, so there should be one which is which covers the whole Malaysia. Then you have a better overview. So what happens with this? Eh? With a lot of these problems, some of the initial problems, the government has introduced something like insurance. Eh? It's not actually insurance. Uh, why? Because there's no premiums collected. These are basically subsidies by the government, eh? which I think is, is good. Yeah, It's a step forward, yes. Uh, should it be continued? Definitely. But we already have universal health coverage. Eh? So this is something just to promote you know, themselves and uh, to say that this is devoted for the B40. So, the big one would be the Pekka B40. Another one would be the My Salam. What's the difference? One is the elderly, specifically for elderly. More than 55, they have like reduced it to 40. So if you're more than 40, you're the low income group, you can actually access healthcare. Now you can still access healthcare, yeah. But then we see that there's a lot of people who do not come forward for, for access. And you have another one, which is the My Salam, which goes from the 18 to 55. So that's the age range. So they get a lot of health benefits as well, like uh, transportation costs. You know, there's, of course, there's a ceiling. Yeah, there's a ceiling for that, and uh, you get a lot of subsidiaries uh, for 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 healthcare. So these two are the so-called insurance. It's not actually insurance. Eh? 
Uh, the Mai Salam was uh, this initial funding with uh, supposedly this Great Eastern Holding uh, Insurance Company. But uh, some of my colleagues who are in the uh, Ministry of Health, they say there's a lot of problems eh, with Mai Salam. And uh, of course, it's very hush hush as well, so I, I really don't know. And, uh, one of my students is doing on Toker B40, one of my students is doing on Toker B40, not my son. So another study that we are doing at the moment, and my PhD study is there, uh, uh, Puan Hazila, she's a trained nurse in the uh, Ministry of Health, and uh, I have a, a, a RA for that as well, uh, Puan Iza at the back. So they are helping with the study. Some of these are very preliminary. Um, we have not put everything inside here. So the studies involve, uh, again, a cross-sectional of the population. Um, a bigger study would be about 100 and 100 and, uh, 1,100 women. A smaller subset would be looking at uh, 250 women and another 250 of children of the B40 groups, right? So we, there's uh, this. Most of these are from the poor urban areas. We actually do go to the rural area in Selangor as well, looking at the women, eh? and uh, these are mostly adults, eh? uh, more than 18 years old. The children we ask the parents, eh? the, the mothers. Eh? For permission, of course, uh, they become the proxies uh, for, for the questionnaire. So, uh, and of course, we use trained enumerators and uh, build a questionnaire, uh, guided. If they don't know, then we intervene and ask them and things like that. So, uh, from the first studies, there's about um, 650 from the rural, about 500 from the urban. Again, the middle income, uh, sorry, middle age uh, group, and also their income is about 3,200. So, so, this is why you have the extreme. Eh? Of from zero to about four thousand. Eh? So how you tackle different tiers will be, have to be very different. Eh? We we can see that now, eh? and I think the government should tackle this. You know, not only B forty, but there's going to be another few layers in the B forty. Eh? So again, majority would be Malays, eh? uh, followed by others, uh, Indians and Chinese. Eh? Uh, most of them are married, you know, uh, and some of them do. Go, uh, majority will go for college and university. So this is good. That means they're trying to access education, right? So this is good. And a lot of them are oh, sorry recipients of the bantuan uh, satu uh, bantuan uh, sarah hidup eh, for the uh, subsidiaries for healthcare uh, for for expenses. Eh. And uh, when you look at this, eh, um, majority will have chronic medical illness. Majority will go for outpatient free services, right? I mean, not surprising. And uh, inpatient as well. Eh. So majority would actually go for inpatient care, eh, rather of course. Because, uh, but you have to understand, eh, when we talk about government means government provided, which is highly subsidized, but when we talk about private, it doesn't have to be only private hospital. They can still go to traditional, and this is what we are worried. If you go for traditional and complementary medicine, uh, not all of these are registered products, you know? so you have to bear in mind. Eh, some may be tainted with heavy metals, you see there's a lot in Malaysia, the government. There's regulations, there, there is, like, there's a difference between the presence of regulation and enforcement. Eh. We do have regulation, but you know, the enforcement might be not so uh, as what we expect yeah, because of reduced resources and priorities. So what we are very worried is that they go and access, access the TCM, which is tainted with other things, you know, heavy metals, you know, drugs and things like that. Yeah. Um, this is what we worry about. So uh, majority are paying from their own um, expenses and some would actually have uh, a bit of insurance. Lah, yeah. So, okay, all right. So this is just the you know, saying the same thing. Yeah. Most of them would actually access uh, from the out of pocket. So when they access from out of pocket um, for the public, this is okay. Um, but if they go to the private, of course, you might be exposed to CHE, yeah, catastrophic heart expenditure. Even now with the public, you have the full paying patients. Do you know that now? I, I mean, for, for those who do not come from Ministry of Health, we have the full paying patient system now in Ministry of Health. That means it's like private view. So you go to the Ministry of Health, you're supposed to get free health care, but the, but the patients, you can actually be tiered into either seeing the public, fully private, uh, sorry, fully public funded tax system, or you can actually opt out and a bit of payment to the hospital, public hospital, with some payment, not as high as the private, yes, but there's some payment, and this is called the full paying patients. And you can see the disparity. And there's another student of mine doing that as well. And you can see that how the doctors relate to patients who are in these two areas are totally different. Of course, like, uh, the incentive that you get to see private patients is, is of course definitely higher. Yeah. Uh, which is a sad story. I, I know this is income for the hospital and income for the country, you know, but how to maintain the equality for both groups. 
Alright, um, and uh, okay, this is like the slot. Yeah, that, okay, I just like show this. So we compare between the rural and urban uh, respondents, yeah, where we can see the psychology health for rural respondents is so called normal compared to the urban. So urban has more risk for psychological health. Yeah. For the quality of life for rural respondents is slightly higher compared with the urban, and we start to wonder why. Yeah. We have not gone to the why. But the result shows that if you are if you're a B40 woman, you live in the urban, your quality of life is slightly higher, and it's, it's significant, it's slightly higher than the people who live in the urban. So maybe in the rural, either their coping is better or they are able to access other things as well. You know, maybe they can plant their own food, you know, raise some chickens, or go fishing, or something like that, compared with the urban. Right? And this is said. We've seen a lot of cases where you have the coffin. Uh, just recently, they showed the Hong Kong uh, population. And of course, the low-income population in in Hong Kong and things like that. They live in coffin-like areas, very small, right? And and this is where they, their husband and even like one or two children might live, eh? which is just like a square meters of things. And this is where the, the toilet is. At. And and does that mix our urban population thing? Is this why the, the reason why the rural population have higher quality? We're not sure. So th these are something which we dwell upon. Eh? Uh, but the result was that. And the uh, bad diet practice for uh, rural respondent is higher compared to the urban. And we start to think, okay, why is that so? Eh? Is, is the urban more exposed to media? Um, when we say uh, rural respondent bad diet, does that mean that they eat a lot more carbohydrate compared with the urban areas, eh, women? And the uh, needs, eh? we ask about needs as well. How do they feel? Eh? The needs for healthcare, the needs for that, and etc. So, so the needs for uh, rural respondents is higher compared to the urban. And the holistic health for rural is also higher compared to the urban. Eh? So we see this uh, sometimes, we, on overall, we see that as if the urban is you know, uh, higher quality of life and whether they are unsatisfied with certain things as well. Eh? And when we look at the rural only, which is about 600, and we compare between the two groups, we see that, of course, um, this is not surprising that the B40 group, they have lower quality of life, and this is proven as well. Okay? Then we look at the comparative between the urban and also the poor, okay? the, the poor urban and also the rural urban, right? So the blue would be the poor urban, eh? miskin bandar. Eh? So these are people who are living in the cities, but they are poor. That means they live in flats, low income flats and things like that. Eh? So that would be the blue. The red would be the low income, but they live in the rural area. Eh? So these are the women who are maybe, you know, um, non, non working women. Eh? The, the husband may be working and things like that. Eh? And we can see that uh, for the health problems, that means uh, high blood pressure, diabetic, cholesterol and things like that. <coughs> Most of this would be the rural women. Eh? Rural women will have higher hypertension, higher uh, higher hypertension, and diabetic would be the other way around, and also higher cholesterol. Eh? So then we start thinking, okay, is it because the number of healthcare providers are not enough? Or is this because the healthcare providers are there, the clinics are there, but they never access? Or is this because they actually have a clinic, they do access, but the treatment is substandard? We don't know. Again, that's going to be another new ball game. Eh? So, just having hit this and that doesn't mean that you know everything is right as well. And we can see that the symptoms as well. Eh? So, a lot of them would have things like headache and things like that, eh? uh, a bit of cough, uh, fever, and things like that. Then we start thinking, okay, are they actually living in too close area that they're having all this cough? You know, URTI because you know the cause of death can be actually community acquired pneumonia. That we, we, we can assume a lot of things, eh? but again, it's never proven. Eh? But we can see that there's, um, a lot of them are having a lot of symptoms as well. Eh? So then we look at the um, other aspect, which is the uh, sub smaller subset eh? of women. Eh? Again, uh, this is done but at other areas. This is the urban poor only. Eh? And we have about 250 urban poor women only. And we look at the number of diseases, NCDs so will be diabetic, high blood and high cholesterol will also be high. Eh? Most of these are non-working eh? and a lot of them are actually obese. Eh? So when, when we say that obesity, then we start thinking, okay, uh, are they accessing a lot of carbohydrates and um, you know, food which is not healthy? Eh? 
and the prevalence of these NCDs is, is actually very crucial. Eh? Obesity was about 33%, eh? um, high BP was about 20, 16% for diabetic, cholesterol was about 8. So this is in concordance with the you know some data of, of Ministry of Health as well, eh? where you have this pyramid of high BP and diabetic and of course high BMI. Eh? Uh, so obesity is a problem. Now if you have only obesity that doesn't cause so much problem, right? Like you have only one disease that's very rare. It's not to say that we promote obesity, but if you are able to be just obese without any other problems, the risk is still you know manageable. Unfortunately, once you are obese, you, you don't have like obesity to the end of your life, you have other things coming in, which is your diabetic, hypertension, and things like that. So some studies have shown that you know you have only obesity, that means this is earlier on, your obesity, and your you have only obesity, your risk of death is basically someone with is almost the same with someone who do not have any other diseases. But once you have obesity, basically you're gonna end up with a train of other diseases as well. So this is where you get your hypertension, you get your of course the highest risk would be someone who has a global disease of everything, right? And and we look at the children. Remember we talked I have a subset a study where we look at children of B40 mothers. Eh? So the children was was very interesting. A high percentage would actually be obese as well, right? And this when we say children this is a 12 years old and below, eh? 12 years old and below. <coughs> uh, of course we have the ethics approval and things like that. So majority uh, I mean from the result of course majority would be normal. Eh? Majority would be normal. But when we talk about abnormal finding, we we'll see that majority would be obese. Eh? Some would actually have stunting and some would be actually have exposed to wasting as well. Then we start thinking, oh my god, this is happening. I mean, but this is not surprising as well. The last UNICEF report in 2018 showed a similar trend. So this is just, I'm, I'm, I'm just like trying to validate the UNICEF finding. Of course, the UNICEF finding is, is solid, but I'm just trying because everybody was saying that there must be something wrong with this UNICEF finding. There must be something wrong. We have our the, our uh, deputy vice chancellor calling me out and say that, hey, you are from the public health. Can you verify this? No, I don't believe this report. Then we, then of course we start to panic now. And then we said, oh, okay, okay. Uh, we just do a, like a small subset of a few children from the B40 woman and we just look at it. But it's true. Yeah. Um, and again, then we start to worry some more eh? because once that happened, that means whatever the government has done it has not been foolproof. Eh? Uh, and, they might, and these are areas in the urban poor, these are children in the urban poor, we, uh, we look at specifically for urban poor, because the UNICEF report actually concentrated on urban poor. Okay? So we tried to validate that, and we had uh, similar findings, so now we're even more scared of people calling out. Okay? So, and the vaccine status, eh? you've heard about the anti-vax for those who are uh, living in Malaysia, you must be exposed, there's a lot of problems with anti-vax now. Yeah? People are denying vaccines for their children, again, why? and how to promote you know better vaccine coverage for these children eh? and we see that you know complete would be like 80 percent yeah not surprising non-complete would be zero but then not sure then we start thinking oh god okay of course we have to verify with the their cards and things like that but sometimes they lost their card eh? especially if the children is already uh, uh, school going age eh? and uh, sometimes they don't know the card and things like that so they're unsure and then we start thinking oh my god is this a, a pool of you know um, anti-vax you know in, in this population and so on eh? And um, so, uh, very interesting and, and very scary as well. And and this was, uh, of course, because majority of the our clients are Malay, so of course it's going to be significant. And because we tried to compare Malays and others, eh, and then we look at, uh, of course, uh, it was significant. Eh, and a lot of them are, of course, normal, but you have a, a bit of obesity and things like that. So we're very worried. Eh? How, how do we manage these children? Eh? What type of nutrition strategies would be best for the government to implement it because they have the school health program apparently it's not working it has come to a halt they're trying to initiate the food bank but who to target food bank again who will donate the food so the results of the NCD the among the women and this is not surprising this is in concordance with our national strategy plan and these are some of the results and so on and you see that our our prevalence of obesity for the B40 woman is relatively you know quite high as well so um, and then we start to wonder okay how the how do we tackle this problem of obesity among the children there's a lot of studies but how do we actually tackle is just physical activity sufficient is there any other things that you need to put in should a specific module of eating for b40 children be developed should there be a specific module for the mothers of b40 women on developing food for the their children because you know the price of even anchovies you know even good quality eggs I, i'm not talking eggs in general you have you have many types of eggs right 
you have like class A, class B, C. The C would be the cheapest and the thinnest layer of 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 egg skin, right? You all know this. Uh, Some yeah. of you like. Do you have So these are type of food that you know the the B40 are accessing. Eh? So how should a specific module or nutrition be developed for the mothers? Who should do this? The Ministry of Health is it should be the Ministry of Higher Education? Should it be the universities? Uh, who to initiate the collaboration? So there's a lot of things finger pointing. Eh? Then there were some NGO meetings that I actually participated. Uh, this one will say that, that one will say this. Then uh, you know, then they start the blaming process. In the end, there's no conclusion in how to tackle the problem. So there's of course there's modules. I mean there's there's pilot projects eh? here, there, and, and, and a few a few studies eh? here and there. Pilot projects on some success, some failures, and things. Like that. But which pilot studies to actually take the best? The best would be to have the participation from the mothers, but also from the healthcare provider. The question is that how do you sustain that? Most of the time, we we actually uh, look at our grant. The grant is let's say 100k, 100,000, uh, you know, for one year. Everybody is all out for that. Then after one year, the run, the the, the fund runs out. Eh? Who to continue? There's no continuity. Yeah, we start we start to say okay, this should be done by the community leaders. Who the community leaders? The community leaders are very dependent on the budget that you give. You don't give incentive that they're not going to come. So the the cycle of cycle of life. Or cycle of death so this cycle of doom like goes around and around so in the end there's no answer of course we know the the best answer we know this but where did the fun come from yeah? um, example eh? I, I still have time right Michelle? Yes. Okay, thank you. this one example I just went to a mercy meeting yesterday on migrants they say there's potential budget from Qatar okay? potential budget for migrants only Rohingya they want to concentrate there, right? but they only want to assess certain aspects. Um, then I say, okay, let's say we do this study, which I think should stress on women's health, sexual reproductive health, uh, uh, safety for sexual reproductive health, uh, sexual abuse, and of course mental health, because I think a lot of these women, plus I think adolescents and men would have these problems as well. Then I say, okay, once we know the prevalence of this mental health, let's say I do simple DAS, eh? depression, anxiety, and, and stress, then I have this prevalence. Okay, this is the severely depressed, this is severely anxious, this is severely stressed out. Where do I go? Then they say, okay, probably we should just send to the NGO clinics. Eh? Where they don't have psychiatrists, they have only counsellors. Now, there are other counsellors trained to actually manage these cases. And these cases, remember they are migrants and asylum seekers, some of them do not have UNHCR card. They cannot access healthcare. They're very scared of policemen. They're very scared with anyone with uniform and things like that because of the persecution. So who to refer? So I say in the end we are not able to do intervention properly. So and then they say that okay the fund will run out, run out uh, after one year they are just going to drop the fund. Then who to sustain? You know so this thing is like it's like a cycle. Of course it's good to do, but in the end you know once you have that, what do you do after that? You know things like that. Anyway, not to get everyone depressed. Um, so this was the prevalence, eh? uh, 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 the one that we found, and uh, this was from the report, eh? the UNICEF Urban Child Poverty uh, is quite small. These are one, some of the reasons, eh? the, the green was the highest, the high price eh? and insufficient income. This is what I mentioned, because uh, we, we, we know how to cook. I mean, as a woman, most of us would know how to cook for the family. But the problem is that how to buy the food for the family. You have one children, okay, it's, it's relatively okay lah. One children, right? Specifically, you eating it with your child. But if you have like four children and the average uh, number of children for Malaysia in general would be like three point something. That means you have either three to four. That's the that's the majority. And of course, someone will have less. You know, uh, someone will have more than five children. Eh, your multi gravid and so on. So how do you make sure that they know how to cook for the children uh, or the family using low budget food? Then you start thinking, oh my god, low budget food is this? Substandard food quality, beras yang dah expire, you know, telur yang yang busu, or thing. Then you start, you know, there's a lot of things coming in. Eh? Who to take the the champion? Of course, it should be the government, you know. But these are the issues. Eh? The government is still pro is still uh, trying to um, put their grip uh, on the population and 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 trying to compare with the previous government and so on. So this has not been tackled. Eh? For for my opinion, this has not been tackled properly. Eh? Dulu kita ada pun yang klinik yang boleh yang dia boleh beli barang makan tu pun uh, klinik uh, apa supermarket satu Malaysia kedai satu Malaysia kedai yang previously we have uh, what they call in uh, the previous government they have what they call the shop 
where the B40 can actually buy you don't, you don't have to be 40 lah you, you can be a rich person driving a Mercedes you can still buy at the shop right so it's called the Kedai Satu Malaysia yeah it's the one Malaysia shop something like that where you have your basic groceries you can buy rice no eggs oil um, a lot of things as well but then uh, of course it's, it's good in the beginning but after a while no monitoring leakages leakages that means they just try to gain profit they don't maintain the quality of the food most of these become expired you know your flour is full of kutu uh, lies you know the uh, you know um, and, and things like that so there was an issue so then they closed down so in the end uh, where do the pop this b40 population actually gain cheap food you know the the subsidy for oil in Malaysia which is relatively good eh? um, B40 access that, of course the M40 also access that. You no, know, so you don't get the sub, you don't actually this targeted subsidies eh? um, in that sense. Eh? And now you have the full paying patient. Eh? Uh, uh, of course this is for the high income. Eh? Okay, so that's the report. You can look at the report. Eh? Uh, so I, I'm not going to discuss so much. Eh? I'm, I'm nearing my end. Um, it's just to show that the problem for the B40, especially for women, it is still a big problem, especially NCDs. Uh, we have a lot of communicable disease. But from the data, you know, cause of death for women, one of two top is actually community acquired uh, or infection, eh? uh, pneumonia. Then we start thinking, oh my God, are, are these the same people who are actually having this problem? Why are they delaying access? They have this cough, cold, or fever. Why don't they access? And when we did a qualitative study, we, remember we talked about the UNDP five years now that we did some uh, qualitative study. They they simply mentioned, I'm a single mom. Uh, according to the law, I'm not going to get a divorce until my husband says I'm divorced and so I cannot marry off to another person. So I'm living alone with my, like say, four children, let's say example. Four children, one of them is disabled. How am I going to look for food? I can't work. I don't have an income, you know. How to send my children to the kindergarten because the cost of kindergarten or the cost of uh, preschool is so high. So then the children will forego the education. So this is like, you know, a never-ending story. Uh, we know this problem, but how to tackle it? At the moment, there's a lot of NGO doing this and that, but again, uh, we need a segregate, uh, we need a standardized, you know, uh, collaboration of all and actually how to tackle it. Um, if we start to be champion in this area and that area, and someone else can say, no, I'm doing a better job than you, you know, things like that. Eh? So there's no cooperation between the, the these champions as well. That's my personal opinion. Eh? All right, so the next mission plan, they should target this as well. Uh, I, I think all this discussion has been discussed. Eh? So um, basically, we can start our discussion if you want to ask anything or discuss anything. Thank you. Thank you so much.